morning. You know, this is such a beautiful day, isn't it? How can you possibly enjoy it sitting down? So please stand up. Come on. And we're going to start with a song that uh, many of you know really well. Let's see if I can get the right key here. Uh, this, uh, this is a song that I used to sing when I was in high school with Diana. We had a book called Singing Youth. I can't remember the number of the, the number, page number of the song, but we know the song. In fact, we could probably sing all three or four verses by heart. We're just going to do one verse and a couple choruses, but uh, I'll bet you know. My 
Father, because you live, you live for us, Lord, and we want to thank you that we too can live. Thank you for letting us be in your sanctuary today to honor you for all you have done for each of us. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. This morning, just stay right where you are. Don't move and just turn to someone where you are and just welcome them. We hope each of you feel really warm and welcome today. We're so glad you're here. And um, all of our visitors, we especially want to make it a special day for you. And I know that God's blessings will be on you. So God bless each one of you as you worship with us today. God's love is a very powerful force that many of us don't really appreciate because, well, because we get wrapped up in our lives so much, we don't learn how to receive it. We're going to sing a medley of two songs today that talk about the power of God's love, how it changes us, and the power of God's love, how it gives us life and renews us. And we just, uh, our, our worship team wanted to dedicate this to uh, Mick and Harleen, particularly Mick, that God would restore him to health. He's such a, a, an important part of our Celebrate Recovery uh, ministry. Why don't you start out on this one?
Why don't you stand with us and sing this song? Ladies, start out now. thank you so much that uh, you've promised to come close to us today and every single day. We've gathered here as your children, as those who believe in Jesus Christ. And, and I, I have to believe, Lord, there's a little bit of a critical mass here for people seeking you. And we just ask, God, that you would make us aware of your great and wonderful and loving presence today that your healing, life-giving power would be here in this place. As we seek you, as we hear your word, as we share together in fellowship in the name of Jesus.
Work in our lives right here, right now, today, God, we pray in Jesus' name. And be seated.
that's your prayer today, will you say amen? Amen. 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 Today we're starting a new series called Come Alive. And uh, I thought about this in terms of uh, a verse that we were reading several weeks ago in our small group. Our small group has started studying the, the book of the letter to the Ephesians. And in verses 1, 19 and 20, uh, chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, this is what uh, Paul says to the Ephesians. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for those of us who believe, in, believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now, it's so easy when you read the Bible to just read over stuff, right? You know, you ever get, gotten up in the morning? Getting up, that's a new one, isn't it? <laughs> getting up, I'm getting up this morning. <laughs> I lived in Georgia for a while, so I can do that authentically. But uh, <clears throat> you ever gotten up in the morning and you're doing your devotions, you're going to read you're going to read your scripture passage, and you find yourself, you're reading, and then about 15 minutes go by, and you come to the end of the third chapter, and you don't even know what you read. You ever had that? Well, maybe I'm the only one. I don't know. It's easy to pass it over, but I want you to focus on this, a couple of phrases here. Because when I read it this time, and when we talked about it in our small group, it just jumped out at me, and I realized this probably is the secret. In fact, I think it is the secret of of what we need as as followers and believers in Jesus. What we need to bring our belief into reality. What we need to bring our our value system, biblical viewpoint, and and biblical worldview into a life uh, reality. And this is what he says. I pray that you will understand, read this with me. The incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. So he wants us to understand his power, God's incredible power. Now read this with me. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the heavenly places. But this is the same power that brought Jesus Christ back to life, the same power that, is, that, that enabled Jesus to come back to life is the power that Paul says is at work in you and me. There, there's a problem. <laughs> the problem is we don't really realize what's going on. We don't really realize what God has for us, what he is so anxious to do in us, through us, for us, with us. I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead. Now, I could just preach it from here, but we have a story we're going to have at this point. So what we've decided to do, uh, because I think this this is just one of the most important and most glorious messages of the Bible. What we decided to do is look at five stories in the Bible, not today, but today's one, and then over the next four weeks, four more stories that are stories of resurrection. See, it wasn't only the resurrection of Jesus, but in the Old Testament, there are some stories of resurrection. And so each week, we're going to look at a a resurrection story. Uh, In a couple of weeks, uh, two or three weeks, Pastor Tom's going to preach on the story of well, I'll let you come and find out. But, but uh, today, we're going to focus on a really interesting story from the Old Testament, from the book of 2 Kings, uh, chapter 4. And I asked Dennis, who is, who is uh, he's the voice at North Hills, the voice. Now, Bob Baldwin is the voice emeritus, right? But Dennis, is, uh, Dennis has been his protege for years, and, you know, he's kind of come into his own. So I've asked Dennis to come, and I, and I asked him to read the story. I want you just to listen to the story. We don't have it on the screen. If you have a Bible, you can turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. But in your, in your outline, inside, is the actual story of Elisha and the woman of Shunem. One day, Elisha went to the town of Shunem. A wealthy woman lived there and she urged him to come to her home for a meal. After that, whenever he passed that way, 
he would stop there for something to eat. She said to her husband, I'm sure this man who stops in from time to time is a holy man of God. Let's build a small room for him on the roof and furnish it with a bed and a table, a chair and a lamp. Then he will have a place to stay whenever he comes by. Well, one day Elisha returned to Shunem and he went to this upper room to rest. He said to his servant Gehazi, Tell the woman from Shunem I want to speak to her. When she appeared, Elisha said to Gehazi, Tell her, We appreciate the kind concern that you've shown us. What can we do for you? Can we put in a good word for you to the king or to the commander of the army? No, she replied. My family takes good care of me. Later, Elisha asked Gehazi, well, what can we do for her? Gehazi replied, she doesn't have a son, and her husband is an old man. Call her back again, Elisha told him. When the woman returned, Elisha said to her as she, as she stood in the doorway, next year at this time, you will be holding a son in your arms. No, my lord, she cried. Oh, man of God, don't deceive me and get my hopes up like that. But sure enough, the woman soon became pregnant. And at that time, the following year, she had a son, just as Elisha had said. Now one day, when the child was older, he went out to help his father, who was working with the harvesters. Suddenly he cried out, My head hurts! My head hurts! His father said to one of the servants, Carry him home to his mother. So the servant took him home, and his mother held him on her lap. But around noontime, he died. She carried him up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, then shut the door and left him there. She sent a message to her husband, Send one of the servants and a donkey so that I can hurry to the man of God and come right back. Why go today, he asked. It is neither a new moon festival nor a Sabbath. But she said, it will be all right. So she saddled the donkey and said to the servant, hurry, don't slow down unless I tell you to. As she approached the man of God at Mount Carmel, Elisha saw her in the distance. He said to Gehazi, Look, the woman from Shunem is coming. Run out to meet her and ask her, Is everything all right with you, your husband and your child? Yes, the woman told Gehazi. Everything is fine. But when she came to the man of God at the mountain, she fell to the ground before him and caught hold of his feet. Gehazi began to push her away, but the man of God said, Leave her alone. She's deeply troubled but the Lord has not told me what it is. Then she said, Did I ask you for a son, my Lord? And didn't I say, Don't deceive me and get my hopes up? Then Elisha said to Gehazi, Get ready to travel. Take my staff and go. Don't talk to anyone along the way. Go quickly and lay the staff on the child's face. But the boy's mother said, As surely as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I won't go home unless you go with me. So Elisha returned with her. Gehazi hurried on ahead and laid the staff on the child's face, but nothing happened. There was no sign of life. He returned to meet Elisha and told him, The child is still dead. When Elisha arrived, the child was indeed dead, lying there on the prophet's bed. He went in alone and shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Then he lay down on the child's body, placing his mouth on the child's mouth, his eyes on the child's eyes, and his hands on the child's hands. And as he stretched out on him, the child's body began to grow warm again. Elisha got up, walked back and forth across the room once, and then stretched himself out again on the child, 
This time the boy sneezed seven times and opened his eyes. Then Elisha summoned Gehazi. Call the child's mother, he said. And when she came in, Elisha said, Here, take your son. She fell at his feet and bowed before him, overwhelmed with gratitude. Then she took her son in her arms and carried him downstairs. That was, a, that was an awesome story. And I, I, maybe, it, maybe you were so moved that you just were paralyzed. Is that what it was? So, so when we did our Bible, uh, our Bible series a few months ago, I started out by talking about three things when you read the Bible that you should keep in mind because we, we usually go right to interpreting things. I talked about the O... Uh, IA principle, I think it was, OIA principle. The first one was observe. So I, I just want to ask you, Dennis, what in the story, as you read it, what did you, what did you observe? What jumped out at you in this story? This, this is not rehearsed, by the way. He didn't know I was going to do this. Well, the ordinariness of it. There was some kindness that was offered, and it was an ordinary family. And God looked for a way through Elisha to just reach out to them. Okay. Anybody, anything else as we read the story, just the details of the story, was there anything that just kind of grabbed your attention? Other than the fact the boy came back to life. But. The woman wasn't interested in Gehazi. She wasn't interested she in Gehazi. Yeah. I, Diane and I watched a special this week uh, where Oprah goes to visit uh, uh, a Hasidic Jewish family in Brooklyn. And she spends a couple days there. And, and in the Hasidic Jewish culture, and I, don't, I, and I think that this was probably somewhat true in ancient times, men and women never, ever touch. Only, only husbands and wives in the privacy of their bedrooms at certain times of the month. <laughs> never do they touch. And so for a woman to grab his feet, Gehazi, see, this is, I learned something new today. I always, I always grew up, pronounces his name Gehazi. <laughs> so thank you, Dennis. That was nice. So, so Gehazi is saying, don't, you know, you're not supposed to touch him, perhaps. You know. Anybody else? Any other details or anything that jumped out at you in the story? Well, she like, seemed to have very strong faith from the beginning, more so than the people right. that surrounded her. Very she strong. See into him. Right. Very strong faith in the beginning. Okay. Any last thoughts here, Dennis? I'm thinking Elisha is sort of carried along by the story himself. It's not like he knew instantly, here's what I'm going to do. But he, he had some sense that God wanted to do something for her. And uh, even in his prayer, I, I thought how different this is from just sort of offering a prayer or saying a prayer. He engages God. He paces. He walks back and forth. He doesn't just pray for yeah. this boy, but he actually lies on top of him and does sort of a like God and Adam. Sort of, sort of thing. It's the first mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation in human history, I think. I don't know. Someone said, no, God and Adam was. I said, no, that was initialization. That wasn't CPR. But, <laughs> but that's true. That's true. He, he, he really is, he's learning as he's going along. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dennis. That was great, wasn't it? Thank him again. All right. So, uh, first of all, uh, I have to say, uh, if this story is about anything, it's about hospitality. Hospitality pays. The lesson, one of the lessons, it's actually not one of the lessons that I have down, two lessons. This is a free one, a third free one that I'll tell you first. Feed the preacher, okay? <laughs> yeah, so uh, hospitality pays, and uh, uh, that's one reason why we have Lots of good food here on Sabbath morning for people because we, want, we believe in hospitality. We believe that we can never give to people to, to help them in their comfort and their needs more than God will give us back. So that's not on the outline, but it's just for you. Now, the, the second thing I want to say before we, we get into these lessons is uh, I, I'm in the application part of the OIA. I'm, I'm going to skip the interpretation because what I have to say about this story really doesn't have anything to do with the story except in a very general sense. Okay, I'm just kind of extrapolating a couple of lessons that I see about the idea of resurrection from this story 
But don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not I- interpreting. I mean, there are some... Dennis said this is a very, uh, what do you call it, a normal situation? There's some bizarre details here. I'm sorry, you know. So I'm not going to pretend to go in and interpret all those things. However, in reading the story and hearing it, hopefully it will, it will stimulate some questions in your mind. And you'll go home and you'll do some research and see if you can find some hooks to hang your, your questions on and uh, some information. So the first, the first lesson that I see here when it comes to the idea of resurrection. Because when we read this text from Ephesians, it talks about, I want you to understand God's great power, the power that raised Jesus from the tomb is the same power at work within you. So as we're talking about these stories of resurrection, I want you to think, each week, I want you to think about resurrection power in your life. Not just somebody who actually physically dies, but resurrection power in your life with God every day. So the first lesson is this. This is really, this is an easy one. You should have already had the blanks filled in without seeing it. Sin makes us spiritually dead. Duh. (laughs) The wages of sin is death, right? Uh, The boy, he died. How did he die? What is the, what's the feeling you get here? It doesn't say explicitly, but what's the idea that you get here? Yeah, heat stroke. He's out working in the fields. He's laboring, and the, the elements, the heat gets to him, and it kills him. Well, how about uh, us in our daily lives? Again, this is what they call a homiletical application. <laughs> it's when a preacher takes a verse and just turns it around to make it mean what he needs it to mean. How about in our lives? Do we ever work hard? Anybody here ever work hard? I'll bet you do. How about... How about we, we work so hard to, to, to survive and to make things uh, the way we think they ought to be? We work hard to, to be good. We work hard to, to overcome our faults. We work hard to, to make up for our mistakes and our sins. And if we are unprotected, I don't think he had any sunblock on. I don't think he had a hat on. If we are unprotected, guess what? It can get to us. It can kill us. It can kill us. Spiritually, if we do not have the protection and the power of God in our lives as we live our lives trying to manage spiritually, secularly, whatever, day by day, we're going to get worn out. We're going to get exhausted. We're going to get sick, and eventually we're going to die. Spiritually, we'll become dead. If you try to live the Christian life without the power of Jesus Christ, you are going to kill yourself spiritually. And you're going to come into church or you're going to go to some religious meeting and you'll just be like an Adventist zombie. Like, praise God from whom all blood. You know, I see that in church. I mean, you think I'm joking, but the truth is a lot of times people come to church and when we sing songs that should, that should just lift us up to God, we're just like, okay, we can just make it through. Maybe next time I'll just wait until the singing's over and I'll come in. You know? Nobody ever felt that way, right? Uh-huh. Why do you keep on rebellion, rebelling, Isaiah says in chapter 1 of Isaiah? Why do you keep on rebelling? Rebelling? Do you want to be punished even more? Israel, your head is already covered with wounds. Your heart and mind are sick. From head to foot, there's not a healthy spot on your body. You're covered with bruises and sores and open wounds. Your wounds have not been cleaned or bandaged. No medicine has been put on them. What happens to people who have deep wounds and serious injuries and they don't get any treatment or, or, or medicine for their injuries? What's going to happen? sepsis is going to set in, you know, infection is going to take place, and if it isn't taken care of, it can kill you. And God says to his people, don't you realize you, you, you're, you're saying you're, you're my people, but you are a mess. You're sick, and if you don't get treatment for it, you're going to die. But one of the things about us is we want to look good, right? We want to look good. We want to put on a good exterior so that's why we we go through this thing tom tom has said this so many times and we've all said it 
Tom has practiced for several years now not saying it. It's like, hi, how are you doing? And what's the answer? Fine. Yeah. Fine. And those of you that are in recovery and celebrate recovery and particularly Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous or any anonymouses, you know that they're, that's an acronym. I won't say what it is in some circles, but it's fearful, insecure, neurotic, and uh, emotional. And there's like lots and lots of meanings to that word, fine. The truth is we're not fine, although we want people to think, it's okay, I'm fine, it's okay. Just like the woman in the story, I found it very interesting when her husband says, where are you going? Your, your wife ever take off in the car? It's like, I got to go, I got to go to the store. And you say, why? Where, where are you going? We don't need anything. Well, her answer is, her answer is shalom. That's actually the word, I guess, that's used, shalom. It's okay, peace, just chill, you know. I'll be back, I'll be right back. We want to look good, you know. Everything's fine. When I was, uh, when I first went to New England to go to college, I, a friend introduced me to one of the most beautiful parks in the United States. I mean, this, this place is just, it's almost like heaven. You know, all those pictures in the Bible story books at Adventist, have printed over the years that are painted about heaven, the beautiful flowering trees and running brooks and all that. Uh, and, and in the springtime, this place is just a wonder to behold. I think it's maybe 100 acres. Well, the, it's a beautiful place. People go there to have picnics. They go there to have weddings. They go there to watch the birds as they migrate. But you know what the place is? It's Mount Auburn Cemetery. It's Mount Auburn Cemetery. It's full of dead people. Jesus said this to the people who wanted to look good. He said, you're like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. When we are not alive with Christ, but we profess to be followers of Christ, we're just like a beautiful grave. Beautiful look out on the outside, might be serene and peaceful out there, but inside you're just full of death. Old bones. Everything unclean, Jesus says. And Paul says to Christians, he takes it beyond, you know, we could say, well, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and they were just, uh, they were all hypocrites. But, But Paul says, you, you believers in Christ, you followers of Jesus, you, in Ephesians 2, 1, you, once you were dead because of your disobedience and of your many sins. Sin makes us spiritually dead. Okay, it's not new, right? But it's true. I like that. It's not new, but it's true. But that's not all there is because we're talking about resurrection, not dying. The second lesson is that faith makes us come alive. Faith makes us come alive. Now, if you're dead, how do you have faith? And this is, this is one of the most beautiful, beautiful parts of this story. I think uh, Mike Day you know, said it in what he said he observed in the story. The, the woman had great faith. Now, who was, who was it that died in the story? The son. He couldn't, he couldn't have faith to believe God's going to raise him from the dead. He's dead, you know. And when you're walking around like a, an Adventist Christian zombie and you're, you're just dead... You may not have the faith to reach out to God. You may not feel like going to church. You may not feel like opening the Bible. And if you do, it may not mean anything to you. It just may be just, just com- a complete blur. Just like I said, you start at, at the beginning of the chapter and read a couple of chapters and you don't even know what you read. You're just going through the motions. This woman had faith. Faith makes us come alive. Faith makes us come alive. There's a couple of things that I want you to think about in this. The first one is found in in, uh, Romans 10, where Paul says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? By the Word of God. So, you're not feeling it. You're feeling as dead as one of those Pharisees looking good on the outside, but all messed up on the inside. But you have a choice to make. I can stay home and wallow in my depression or I can go and hear the songs of Christ sung and hear the word of God preached 
and hear the prayers of the saints prayed. And maybe, just maybe in making that choice, rather than choosing to do something to medicate my depression or my deadness or whatever, maybe by making that choice and choosing to be with God's people, you'll hear the word of God. And Jesus says, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. You know, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't me. <laughs> it isn't how good the preacher is. It isn't how good the songs are. It's the words of Christ. It's the word of God. That's what brings life. If you don't hear those words, you don't have much of a chance of getting the life. If you don't somehow get that inside, maybe, uh, maybe you've had the experience of having a really rough patch in your life where maybe it was a colossal failure or you really let your, your family or God down in some way and you're, you're depressed, you feel like you can never uh, be back uh, with God as, as one of his family. And you're driving down the road and you, you hear a song on the radio. Or you're at home and you hear a song and the song talks about healing and it talks about forgiveness and it talks about grace. Because music has this way of, of touching those emotional chords in our, in our hearts and, 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 and opening us up so that the truth of God can get in there when, when in our minds we'll, we'll be close to it. We're unable to receive it. Faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And, and several times in the Bible, the command is, you know, come alive. Remember the story in Ezekiel where he, it's, it's, I know it's a, it's a metaphor. I know it's a dream he had, but there's this whole valley full of dead bones. <laughs> Ezekiel says, why are you showing me this? And God says, because I'm going to show you I am able to create a miracle. When my people are lost, they're, they're laid waste, they're dead. They're spiritually nothing. When I speak the word, they're going to come to life. And that's what he does. And they're all, they all come back to life right before Ezekiel. Hearing, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, word of God. So if it's a choice to do something or to go to small group, choice to do something else or to come to church, you know, and you're, you're, not, you're not really where you should be, do it. Some people say, well, I... You know, I'm going to come back to church when things get better. <laughs> that's funny. I'm sorry. That's just hilarious. Every week I have to go to church, and lots of weeks things are not better for me. <laughs> but I guarantee you every week that I come here and, and sing, and not just because I'm up here preaching to you, but when I, when I hear you singing, when I participate, when I hear uh, Tom speak or Dennis pray or anybody share the word of God, it does something inside of me. It brings me back to life, to a life that I felt like I was losing. And then there's this verse in 1 John 5, 16, which, which I think is a great correlation with this woman and what she did. If you see any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray and God will give them life. If you see... Any brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death. And, and what I take that to mean is when, if you see somebody doing something that doesn't kill them, you know, because if they're physically dead, it's, it's really out of our hands. It's in God's hands. But, but if, if they're doing something that's taking them away from God, you see that and you pray to God, Lord, help me know what to do, what to say, how to relate to this person so that they don't lose their way. God, the, the Bible says... John says here, God will give them life. He'll give you life or light to give to them. We, you and I, who have faith in God, can bring people back to life. It, it, it just takes a matter of, of caring enough to, to pay attention and to let God's Spirit lead you and, and to take the time to pray for that person or those people. Many of you probably have heard this story of, uh, in the tornadoes that took place two weeks ago in Indiana. There was a family. It was Indiana, right? Or Illinois? Indiana, Indiana I think. So family lived in, in this town that was so devastated. And uh, they showed a picture of their house before the storm. It was a beautiful home, brick home. I mean, it's, you know, a home that you wouldn't 
it, it's not a mobile home. You know, you'd think it would be able to stand up in a, in a storm. Well, the storm came, and, and I don't know where the woman was exactly, but she knew what was happening, and the only thing she could do was, was she had a few seconds to take action to protect her two children. She had a, some kind of blanket or comforter. She wrapped her kids up, and she said she tied them up in this thing, and she, she put her body over the children, kind of like the, the prophet did with the little boy. And she just stayed there. And they were crying, and the, and the sound of, of the tornado was horrific. If you've ever been in one, you know how awful it is and how scary it is. And she felt things falling on her. The whole house was collapsing around her. Well, the storm passed, and she, she looked down, and she realized one of her legs was either severed or nearly severed. But her kids were okay. She saved the life of her kids. She took the action that ne was needed, and she nearly paid for it with her own life. Fortunately, they, her son got up and ran, found somebody and, who came and put a tourniquet on her leg, and she was saved. What, a, what an amazing story. When I, was, when I was thinking about that story, and I was you know, going over the songs we were going to do today, that second song where it says, you know, hold me close, I, I just started crying. <laughs> I think about the times in my life when, when the, the storms of, of sin and Satan are swirling around me and my life is in danger and I just all I can do is cry out, God, hold me close. Hold me close. Maybe there's something in your life today where you're feeling that. You're being attacked in some way. You've got a situation in your family where it, it, it just looks like there's no, it, it looks like there's no way out. There's no way that you can, it can be resolved. And, and what this woman did for her children, because she loved them and she believed that as, her, as their mother, she could make a difference in their lives, is what God, in his great love, has done for us through Jesus Christ. He puts his body over us and he wraps us in his love. And all we can do is say, God, hold me close. Hold me close. Keep me safe because the storm is going to destroy me. We can bring people back to life by praying for them. You should pray and God will give them life. You should pray and God will give them life. And then in Ephesians 5, Paul says this. Everything exposed by the light becomes visible and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. This is why it is said, this is the part I love, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. I, I, can't, I cannot imagine that God's plan was to start the church in such a glorious way in the New Testament where, where the apostles and the believers, there's 120 people in the first prayer meeting up in that upper room, and they were, they were intent on praying for God to show them the next step because their, their number one desire was to, to be reunited with Jesus. Number one desire. And I can't say that for me, and I'll bet a lot of you cannot say this either, for me, my number one desire has always been to be reunited with Jesus. But that's what I know it took. That's where they were at at that point in their lives. And so I can't believe that it was God's intention that, that the church explodes with spiritual life. Everywhere you go, you see people willing to lay down their lives. They bring everything they own before the apostles and say, if this can be used to save another person, if this can be used to bring the light of Jesus to someone who doesn't know him, then take it, use it. And this is not an offering appeal, folks, okay? Just let you know. But that's how the church started. I can't imagine that God's intention was, was that 2,000 years later he would have churches, church buildings full of people who are nothing but walking Christian zombies who, who, who out of habit go once a week and, and, and preachers and, and religious leaders kind of pull their hair out like, how can we get people to come back to church? <laughs> really? Wake up, O oh sleeper, Paul says. Wake up. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. And that's my prayer for my life, 
for my family's life and for your life today. Sin makes us spiritually dead. If we play with it, if we wallow in it, if we go there, we are just going to be dead. Doesn't matter what you look on the outside, look like on the outside, doesn't matter how functional you are. If you're cut off from God, you have no life. But faith makes us come alive. And I believe that God's intention is to bring this little part of his family to life in a way that it's never been living before. So that the, the life and the love and the grace and the healing and the power of Jesus Christ will be present in our part of this world. So I asked Tom if he would uh, lead us in a prayer. I, you know, I could keep yelling here. <laughs> you got the point, right? Everybody got it? Okay, you're supposed to see one of the things you have to learn is, is things that you say back. We, we got to do a little talk back lessons sometimes, but this is one of them. So I say, have you got it? And what did you say? What do you say? Got it. You say, got it. Okay. Got it? All right, good. So I'm going to ask Tom to come up right now. And I asked him to lead us in a prayer of resurrection. A prayer uh, that brings us back to life. And a prayer maybe for, for some of our members who, who are really struggling physically. I mean, we've got some folks who, whose lives are in danger right now, particularly Mick. And that God, God would bring life into them. So I'm just going to turn it over to you, Tom, and... and and you know how we are at North Hills. This is a family, so this is one of those times when you can come right down to the front, and we're all going to all be together in this, uh, in this time of prayer. The thing that hit me uh, in, in listening to what Terry was sharing, um, the story, it's a great story. But he gave a little tiny mention of a a valley filled with dry, dead bones. And I know, I know, uh, having pastored here at this church for 10 years, I know there's a lot of people here that are physically hurting with physical ailments. And I know there's people here that are hurting with emotional ailments. We're broken. All of us are broken in, in one way or another. We, and, and we do this thing of hiding it from, so, from each other so well. You know, I'm fine. We put a smile on our face and inside we're just dying. I want you to think about faith. I want, to think, I want you to think about your life right now where it's at. The events that are taking place in your life. You see, that story... That story about the, uh, the dry, dead bones. Ezekiel watches as God puts the skin back on him, puts the meat back on him, assembles them all back together and hooks them all up. You know, the leg bones connected to the knee bone. You know that song. And when he's all done, there's all these bodies. They're all put back together again. But there's still no life in them. They're still dead. And God tells Ezekiel, speak to the wind and say, breathe. Breathe your life. Breathe into these dead bones. And as he did, they all came back to life, the scripture says. And they stood up on their feet, a great army of them. And I'll tell you something, friends. God wants to make a great army of you people right here, right now. You may think you're dead spiritually, physically. You may think that there's nothing there anymore. The, the, the power of God's word, my friends, is that that word that created us, the word that redeemed us, the word... That, 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 that brought Jesus up out of the grave is the same word that God wants in our hearts, in our lives right now. He wants us to go beyond the, the, the lazy, spiritless lives that we live, and he wants to invigorate us with new life. The, 
Then God said to Ezekiel, These bones represent my people. They're saying, We've all become old dry bones. All our hope is gone. And if you're here today and you feel like your hope is gone, I hope you hear these words, friends. Because God says, Ezekiel, give him this message. O oh, my people, I will open your graves of exile and cause you to rise again. I'll bring you back. And when this happens, O oh, my people, you will know that I am the Lord your God. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. I tell you, friends, that's what God wants for each of us here today. So if you're, if the description fits, if you feel like you're, you're, you're sick, if you feel like hope is gone, I'll tell you something. For six years, I really believed I'd never be well again. And there are people here today that never gave up praying for me. And you never gave up asking God to heal me. And I stand in front of you today healed. The old bones still have life. There's still a resurrection possible. And it could be yours right now. I gave up hope, but your prayers won out. And the same can happen for you right now today. You know, you prayed for me. I wasn't healed in a day. I wasn't healed in a month. I wasn't healed in a year. But by God's grace, I'm healed. And not only physically am I healed, but God healed a lot of the stuff that was up here in my head that needed healing, old attitudes. So if you're broken today, if you're sick today, and you just want to reach out and say, God, may the power of your resurrection come into my life today and make me whole. I invite you to come up here and pray with me. Uh, we're family. And for us to be a family, we have to be healed and well. To have the power of a family. So come up and uh, just say to God, here I, here I am. <laughs> I'm a mess. I need to be well. And I'll tell you, friends, the same miracle that he did for me, he'll do for you. He will. Let's pray. By the power of your name, O oh God, you brought your son Jesus out of the grave. You resurrected him to life. And that life is our life. Oh, God, we have messed up, screwed up. We've made a horrible, horrible mess out of our lives. Every one of us in some way or another. We've made mistakes that are just this awful. We've gotten ourselves into, into, into sickness, largely sometimes by the way that we've treated our own bodies. We've made mistakes hand over fist. There's not a one of us in this place that is perfect. There's not a one of us that has it totally together. We're broken. We're dry, dead bones. And I, I just want to pray right now that in our minds, that analogy that Terry left with us of that woman wrapping her kids up and saving their lives. I just pray, God, that we can see Jesus doing that for us right here, right now, today. 
that he will infuse that power to rise above the problems of our lives and see a God that is so big and so great and to see how that God wants to possess our lives so that we can become an army of resurrected people that can influence the people that we meet every day that will just look at us and say, there is a God because I saw what he did in that person. Thank you, God, for this power that is greater than anything that we could ever ask for, hope for, or imagine. And it is ours right now, this moment, because you said so. In your precious, precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you and keep every one of you.
Sabbath day.